Uh, so they're available at the Welcome Center, and I was able to get the cost down to uh, $3.90 was my cost. Your cost is $4. <laughs> All right? Profit. I'm, I'm making profit. I'm making profit. $0.10 cents profit per volume. So if you're interested, they're out at the Welcome Center. I conveniently stuffed an envelope with the number 4 on it. So if you're interested, please give me 4 bucks. Uh, if you need change, I don't make change. Yes, you do. Does anybody, yes, does you do. anyone want one right now? I'll go get them. Uh, Ruthann is offering to go get you one right now because we are starting in Acts chapter 1. Okay. So just go grab a stack yeah. and just wander through the audience. Good boy. I don't think she heard me. That's probably good. I heard you. I heard you. Let's, uh, let's pray together as we get started. Father, as we look into your word this morning, I pray that you would look into our hearts. Father, I pray that you help us to see in, in the scriptures what it is you need us to do differently, us to be differently, Father. I pray, Lord, as we go through the book of Acts, that you would teach us, Lord, not just information, Father, but action, to put, to put what we know into our daily lives and into our, our being, Lord. I thank you for this congregation, Father. I thank you for the many generous people who enable this ministry, Lord. And I just pray, Father, you watch over us today. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah, today is going to be one of those uh, live action sermons. We'll have a couple things going on up here. Last week we talked about the idea of heritage. And the idea of heritage is that we have a history. And history informs who we are and how we, um, how we act even in today's world. Probably one of the greatest contemporary examples. Now, last week, I used an example from World War II, and we had a bunch of visitors from, from the Bible College, and so you could just tell in the audience, everybody who was my age or older, they got it. They're like, oh yeah, World War II, we, 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 some of you remember that. Yep. Yep. Yes. Now, uh, all the kids were like, what? <laughs> and so I had to kind of on the fly come up with a different uh, example or illustration. And I thought, okay, as I remind you of this idea of heritage, what's a more contemporary um, event, significant event in the life of the country that we all would have as some sort of common ground? And I thought about 9-11. You know, that on 9-11 there were terrorist attacks on the World Trade Centers where uh, two airplanes crashed into these two towers and, and sort of kicked off the, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, young people should remember that, but then I remember, I looked and I saw the date, and I was like, that's, uh, okay, some quick math, 17 years ago. So for some of us, that 17 years is relatively recent history. I'm almost 50, 17 years ago, I was an adult, technically. If you heard that smirk, that was the church secretary smirking. <laughs> But some of you are, are much younger than I am, so 17 years ago, you would have still been a child. So 9-11 was a formative event for many of us. It's, it has informed our present-day perspectives on uh, what it means to live in America, what it means to live as a world citizen, where how do we engage the idea of Islam and the people who are Islamic. 9-11 informs that whether we even realize it or not. So history is full of things like this, and our perspective on these events has sort of created us to be who we are today, whether we even uh, are aware of that. We talked about last week, we talked about how history is full of risks that have rewards, and usually we calculate risks. Before we do something risky, we try to make sure that it work, will work out, and we try to believe that it will work out. My wife is often subject to uh, some of the jokes that I tell you. I try them out on her before I try them out on you to see if it will work out. Because I don't want to take a risk and say something that has no reward. <laughs> Most of the time, she doesn't approve. <laughs> the followers of Jesus will risk their lives for the sake of the reward that God will give them for faithful service. And as we follow Jesus Christ, we believe that God will reward our faithful service. I think that's okay. It's okay to have, now it's not in a, in a, like I don't go to work for Jesus for the paycheck. You see what I'm saying? I go to work for Jesus because of who he is as an act of worship and devotion for him. But I still believe that he will reward me. That's not a wrong thing to think. So the followers of Jesus, uh, in the book of Acts, 
it looks really, really risky, right? Because in the book of Acts, Christianity hasn't started yet. It's still just starting. So the book of Acts is our heritage, it's our history, it colors and helps us understand how we engage the world around us. The book of Acts is very important. It's our heritage, our history. And our history has profound influence on our daily lives. Our history defines our identity and our mission. You know, we mark our personal history in any number of ways. Uh, I had a lot of fun this year. Uh, my four-year-old grandson lives with us. And this year, he started Young Fives Kindergarten, which for us was a big deal. We were so excited <laughs> to put him on the big yellow bus knowing that it's going to be years and years. Yeah, bye. Have a good time. <laughs> We're going to miss you. <laughs> and so it was so exciting to see everybody else's, you know, first day of school pictures, and you've got everybody kind of hamming it up with mom, you know, rejoicing, and the kids all sad. So it was really fun to mark that event in Ezekiel's life, you know, with a picture, the first day of school picture. Okay, let's take a picture. But then he got kind of addicted to the pictures, and so it was the second day of school picture, and then the third day of school picture, and I think he's kind of forgotten by now, but we're marking this important event in his life with excitement and celebration. We mark a lot of transitions in the life of a young person. You know, at 16, what can you do? Drive. Drive, yeah. Oh, that's a big deal. You can drive at 16. At 18, you can vote. Probably less enthusiasm there, but... What do kids want to do when they're 18? I want to move out. I want, I want to be independent. I want to do my own thing. And uh, I can remember my kids. I can remember my kids when they would they would come and ask me when they were you know 13, 14. Dad, I want to get I want to get a tattoo. And I would always say yes when you turn 18 and move out. Right? Dad, I want to get a piercing. Oh, you, yeah, you can do that right after you turn 18 and move out. Oh, Dad. 21, you get to decide if you'll drink alcohol or not. Now, a lot of times we, we mark these events and we think that these events are you know, formative in the life of a young person, but what they don't really realize is at 25, your auto insurance goes down. That's how you know you've grown up. There you go. We mark these things. We mark graduations. We mark high school. We mark college. We celebrate years of service with our employer. We celebrate milestones in our marriage. We mark each change of status in a different way, usually with a party and some gifts. And usually, I mess it up. Um, what did we do for our 20th anniversary? Not probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what we're doing for our 30th? Probably nothing. <laughs> I regularly don't mark these things very well. And she has learned that I am an everyday husband. I am not a special event husband. She married the wrong guy. <laughs> but we mark these changes, we mark these milestones in our life. We mark religious changes through ceremonies as well. We solemnize marriages. And let me tell you, folks, I, I got to do two weddings this summer. It was so much fun. It was so much fun to sit down with those kids and talk to them about what it looks like to be married and how to not forget special events. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we dedicate babies. And uh, I'm excited. We have uh, baby Elspeth's dedication is upcoming in, in October. Actually, uh, Corey was able to have her knowing that the year when she turned one would be on a Sunday. So there we go. So good job, Corey. <laughs> Thank you, Elspeth is going to turn one on Sunday. OCD. And then there's going to be a, I didn't hear you. OCD. OCD, yeah. Uh. Um, we solemnize marriages. We dedicate babies. We perform baptisms. Now, baptism is important because it's a ceremony that identifies the person with Christ. It identifies our, our mission, our, our identity is wrapped up in, in that idea of baptism. The book of Acts records the birth of the church and, and the expansion of the early church. It's the continued ministry of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit through the actions of his followers. And Acts is very important. You see, there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts starting from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 28, and it's got like this abrupt ending, like just all of a sudden ends. But the reality of it is, is that the book of Acts is continually being written in the life of the church. The church continues the mission of Acts, and that's going to be very important. So take a look with me, if you would, please, at Acts chapter 1. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then there's Acts and Romans. And Luke, uh, Acts is the second of, of Luke's works here. Uh, he wrote the book of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. The followers of Jesus are identified with the message and ministry of, of Jesus Christ. His mission is our mission. His message is our message. 1 through 5 says this, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, now, there are a couple of introductory matters that we talked about last week. You know, we talked about Theophilus. That Theophilus was probably Luke's patron. He was the one who funded the very expensive writing of the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. And Luke very carefully investigated and wrote down everything that Theophilus needed to know and understand. Jesus gave the disciples many convincing proofs. You see, our religion is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Well, that's something that sort of needs a little bit of proof. I mean, we're worshiping a man who was crucified by the Romans, and they did that very well. They were very good at crucifying and killing people. Nobody recovered from crucifixion, except Jesus. And so the cornerstone of our faith is that Jesus not just died and was buried, but he was resurrected. And the resurrection is what we count on for our personal future. I count on God to bring me back from the dead, to restore something like this body, but a little bit better, right? <laughs> I'd like my back not to hurt, and I'm sure that's going to be the case. So Jesus gave the disciples convincing proofs of that, and he reminded them about his teaching as he spoke about God's kingdom, which at least means that Jesus is the king, right? And if Jesus is the king, then we should be obedient to him. We should be followers of who he is. And then he gives them a command. He says, don't leave Jerusalem. And then he gives the reason for the command. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to do the mission that I'm going to leave you with. Let's focus in on verse 5, where receiving the Holy Spirit is described as baptism. It says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when we think about history, when we think about historical perspective, uh, Jesus has died, has been raised from the dead. He's instructing his disciples. The church hasn't started yet. Okay? You can't, like, go to the corner and, and check in at Pathway Community Church. Well, because we're very far removed from Jerusalem, right? How did the church get from there all the way to here? And everywhere else. That's the story of Acts. So the church hasn't started yet. Jesus is saying, go, and you will be. Now, if you're a grammar nerd, I'm speaking to you, dear. Um, <laughs> this is a future passive verb. It's something that's going to happen. If they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, Jesus is telling them, you will be in the future baptized by an external actor. Because it's a passive voice verb. Something is going to happen to you in the future, and then you'll be able to do the mission. The word baptism is transliterated from the Greek. Now, uh, the Greek word is baptizo, right? The translators weren't quite sure what to do with it, so they just stuck an M on the end, right? So baptizo in Greek is baptism in English. They weren't sure what does it mean. Well, it turns out baptism, or baptizo, is a textile term. Cloth was dipped or baptized into dye to change its color. Well, when we think about the ancient ritual of baptism, ancient people were accustomed to water rituals as an aspect of their religious purification. A ritual washing symbolized one's purification before God. And this kind of washing can take place when one stands on the verge of a new state in life, or is entering into a new community or a new phase of life. So just like we celebrate graduation with a party, they would celebrate dedication to God with a ritual washing called baptism. 
Well, think about uh, John, okay? John the Baptist. So we're, we're thinking about history. We're going back from the disciples who are waiting in Jerusalem. Go back a little bit in history to the Gospel of uh, Luke or John or Matthew, any of them, to the work of John the Baptist. What was he doing? He was baptizing people for repentance. Now, repentance is one of those words where we have to walk it around a little bit. Repentance means a change of mind. And in the time, John was preaching repentance because the, the religious culture had gotten corrupt. So you had rich people abusing poor people. You had a lot of different shenanigans going on. And so John has functioned as a prophet. He said, we need to have our hearts right before God. We need to be doing the right things. We need to be the right people. You see, first century Jews mostly believed that God would be impressed by their detailed observance of the law. They were so concerned with obedience that they added laws to the law to make sure they didn't break the law. This is like deciding, okay, I'm going to be scrupulously obedient to the speed limit, so I'm going to drive five miles an hour below. But then, that's not enough. Because I still, if, I, if my attention wavers, I might creep up there and I might break the speed limit, so I'm going to go 10 miles an hour below the speed limit. That's the kind of obedience, the kind of um, focus that they had. They were so concerned about doing legal things, technical details, that they really lost the spirit of the law. They lost the intent. Instead of humble obedience, many of the Jews were arrogant and divided by class. So that the rich people looked down on the poor people. John the Baptist pointed out their hypocrisy and called them to change their minds and receive water baptism as a symbol of that changed mind. It publicly identified the baptized person with John's message. This resulted in people who were newly open to who God was and to his message. Many of those people then believed in Jesus. At the beginning of Acts, there isn't an established church or even an established Christian religion. They're still waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what's the significance of the coming baptism of the Holy Spirit? You see, what Acts is telling us is you will be baptized. Okay, So what, what's happening is something that is new and unrepeatable in church history. John's baptism in water was symbolic of purification and dedication to a life characterized by repentance. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is still future, is an event that inaugurates a new movement of God in the world. It gives birth to the church. The Holy Spirit's baptism will create something new by the power of God. His arrival will fully identify the followers of Jesus as the empowered people of God. It's more than just a dipping. It's a flood. And it's coming. Can you imagine the excitement that these disciples had. Maybe they didn't fully grasp what was coming. In a couple days, in a, few, in a little while, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. What does that mean? <laughs> William Larkin's commentary described it this way. This coming baptism, then, is to be an overwhelming experience of God's Spirit. It is unique, unrepeatable in church history. This summer, we looked at the Holy Spirit's activity in the Old Testament to prepare for this study in Acts. And the Holy Spirit was active in enabling people to serve God and to speak His message. And the disciples are about to experience His power so that they can go and do the mission that God left them to do. You see, Acts says, you'll be my witnesses. This is the next part. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's why we're here. Because the Holy Spirit came. When I thought about um, when I thought about how to do this, this is for later. <clears throat> when I thought about how to explain this, I try to think about people who've never heard of the idea of baptism before. Okay, so this is water, right? You all know about water, and this is water too, right? And this is food color. I didn't do this beforehand because I was afraid of children. <laughs> I've been around for a while. So now I'm creating, I'm using blue. I hope that's, that you can see it. I'm going to use most of the blue. I'm also a guy, so I was walking around Meyer this morning going, why do I find food color? <laughs> <laughs> Big 
Baking. <laughs> okay. So John's baptism was a baptism in water for repentance. So a person would come to John and they would publicly identify with his mission. So they would, they would be baptized and, and what, what substance changed for them? Nothing. Nothing. But it was a public identification. They got wet to say, hey, this message I agree with. Now what happens when the Holy Spirit baptizes? Well, that's something different altogether. When the Holy Spirit baptizes, it changes. And so here's this, this is now different, right? It's never going to go back, right? Now, okay, it's food coloring, so maybe it will. I don't know. Maybe I could use some Norwex product and, and get this <laughs> thing. But this has changed. It, this is baptized. You see, this is dipped in water, but this is baptized. And what's coming... You know, you have these two items. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blue hand. That one's ridiculous. Uh -huh. That's smurf hand. <laughs> now, what's coming? Uh oh. What's coming is the flood. Right? What's coming is a flood of the Holy Spirit poured out on the church. Y'all sit in the front row? <laughs> Let me put my book away. <laughs> no. 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 No tissue. Woo! <laughs> Settle down, you're not charismatic. <laughs> What's coming is this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this overwhelming flood of God's power. Not willy-nilly power, power for mission, power for purpose, power to do what he's called you to do. And, and okay, I slipped context there, didn't you see it? I'm still talking about those historical people. That, this hasn't happened to them yet, it's happened to you. And when we slip into theology, and uh, let me make sure I've got this right here. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are identified with him and his mission. This happens to you at conversion. When you believe the gospel, when you believe that Jesus Christ died and paid the full penalty for your sins, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, you may not see anything externally. You may not uh, blabber on in tongues. I, you may not. But you're fundamentally different. It's never going to be different. It's never going to change for you. You can't wash that out. You're baptized with the Holy Spirit by the power of God. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're identified with him. You're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the symbol of that is water baptism. So when someone becomes a Christian, they do a water baptism as a symbol of something that has happened theologically inside them. I can't wait to wear out our baptism. I can't wait for those folks who don't know Jesus, come to know Jesus, and then receive water baptism as a symbol of the following of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ or identify with him, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Luke's words in chapter 1 anticipate the coming of the Holy Spirit, where the followers of Jesus will be fully identified with his message and his mission. The Holy Spirit is going to be just poured out on the early church. The text of Acts shows the disciples waiting for the arrival of God's Spirit. They're transitioning to something new. And it's based on something they understand but won't fully realize until it happens. You see, the Holy Spirit will empower the followers of Jesus for their mission to the world. Take a look at verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now we can notice here again, Luke is using these verb tenses to sort of give us the structure here. You will receive power and then you will be my witnesses. This is a literary introduction to the book of uh, of. Acts where Luke anticipates the whole thing. He's going to describe the mission 
of the church to Jerusalem, to Judea, to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what he's going to, that's the whole book of Acts. That's what it's all about. Some commentators suggest that, this, that we're still writing this, and I think that that's true. So the disciples are anticipating the restoration of the political and military uh, rule of God over Israel. And that, that's a fair question, because who is Jesus? He's a king, right? What do kings do? Rule. They rule. Okay, and Israel nationally is being dominated by Rome right now, and they'd like to be independent. You see, they remember a time in their not-too-distant future where they were independent of foreign domination, and so they're hoping that Jesus will come down and kick the Romans out. And so Jesus very politely says, no. No. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? No. And he goes further than that, and he says, and it's not for you to know. You know why? Because he wants them focused like a laser beam that hasn't been invented yet on the mission. He says, you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be my witnesses, and that's the job that you're supposed to do. What will happen? Power for mission. The power they'll receive from the Holy Spirit is not a power that enables them to conquer and dominate others, Jesus commissions them not to build empires, but to confront empires with the truth of the gospel that God is king. This other future passive verb, you will receive power, defines you will be baptized. You see, Luke is writing about what's going to happen. From our perspective, it's already happened. The Holy Spirit has come. He has empowered the mission. And that's why there's a church here in Michigan. We're here because... The followers of Jesus helped other people follow Jesus, who then kept helping other people follow Jesus. And so what's our mission? To follow Jesus and help other people follow Jesus. And where's the power for that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses is the content of the church's mission. It's our mission. It hasn't changed. We're witnesses to the person and work of Jesus Christ in his person. He is the Son of God of the same essence as God the Father. In his work, he provides forgiveness for our sin. He provides a new relationship to God through his death, burial, and resurrection. And he provides us a new relationship to one another. You are my brothers and sisters because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And the, the better we function as a family, the better we represent who he is and what he's done. Now, businesses usually have what's called a mission statement. It defines the primary action of the business, usually in flowery language. Now, the mission statement, for example, of the Coca-Cola company. <clears throat> have you ever thought about the mission statement of Coca-Cola? To sell Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> Here it is. The mission of Coca-Cola is to refresh the world in mind, body, and spirit. <laughs> to inspire moments of optimism and oh happiness through our brands and actions. Hmm. Hmm. I'm happy with a bike Coca-Cola. Now, there's a guy at Coca-Cola who drives a forklift, right? His job is to move pallets of Coke from the warehouse into the truck. That's his job. But the Coca-Cola company would like him to understand that his mission is to refresh the world. So that every day when he's driving that forklift, he's not thinking, drive the forklift. He's thinking, I am refreshing the world. <laughs> Through my actions here to put this beverage on this truck, the world will be a better place because of my actions. Now let me submit to you, I'm not saying that Coca-Cola is a bad company. I don't know. I do enjoy, actually this is going to be a treat for me, this is like dessert. I, get, I don't get to drink this all the time. Mm -hmm. It refreshes me. Oh. I don't know it inspires me, but it does refresh me. The mission statement of the church is this, to be witnesses of Christ in the world. It doesn't matter what your job is. Your mission is to represent Jesus Christ. Your mission is to bear witness to who he is and what he's done. Anything we do is our work. 
should support this mission. David Garland says this, Many Christians today still have their head in the clouds rather than being engaged in their calling to mission. Mission is not a budget item that the church can outsource. Mission is to the church like air is to fire. Without it, the church fizzles out. Now, I don't know about you, but fizzling out is not acceptable. <laughs> I heard your hearts say amen. <laughs> now, when I think about our mission statement at Pathway, it's this, meeting people where they are on their spiritual journeys and leading them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Now, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ means this, that we have to be identified with Christ. We first have to be this. And then we have to fill this up so that when we think about who we are as people, we start with, I am a saved son of God. When I think about you, I think about my brothers and sisters. I think about how can I help you Amen. as best I can. A Christian is one who is like Christ, and so we love and serve other people as best we can like Christ. And when we desire, our, our statement says, to lead people to become fully devoted followers, that's an act of humility, in my opinion. You see, I know I haven't arrived. Every time somebody says, oh, you're the pastor. Oh, I jump off pedestals, folks, as fast as I can because I'm just a regular guy. Leading people is an act of humility because we're still on the journey ourselves. I know I haven't arrived yet. And then we think about meeting people where they are. It means this. We don't look down on other people. Where we disagree, we do it thoughtfully and with kindness. And your task in the church might be administration. And I thank God for the administrators of this church because I ain't one. I don't even know what the church secretary does sometimes. Because she's an administrator. She knows what she's doing. I'm going to trust her with that. Now, occasionally I look and say, is she working? Yeah, she's working. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in my capacity as her supervisor, I know she's doing what she's supposed to do. Your task might be administration, but your mission is to follow Jesus and help other people follow Jesus. Your task might be maintenance, and thank God for those folks who help do maintenance around here. Your task might be finance. Your task might be taking care of children, but your mission is to follow Jesus and help other people follow Jesus. And as your task contributes to the mission, the Holy Spirit gives you power to do it. The Holy, Holy Spirit empowers the followers of Jesus for their mission to the world. And then the final point here is that the followers of Jesus trust in his position and his authority. Take a look at verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly... Two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Now see, when I think about these guys, I think, okay, here's these guys. Jesus is taken up into heaven. I remember this. <laughs> it's a good thing it wasn't raining, right? <laughs> You know, early churches used to have a hole in the ceiling. A little tiny hole. So the Holy Spirit could come back down. <laughs> now don't anybody cut any holes in the roof. Please. <laughs> They're off mission. What have they been told to do? The, the disciples have been told, go to Jerusalem and wait, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And here they are standing up in the sky. I don't know how long it was, but God had to send angels to remind them to get back on mission. If that's true for them, it's true for us as well. Go back to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit. Luke probably has in mind a text from Daniel, uh, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I'll just read it to you. Uh, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so what Luke is doing is he's kind of reminding the early Christians 
of where Jesus is and what he's doing. He has ascended to the right hand of God the Father. He is filled with power and authority and glory. And so you can trust that he is there and working. He's going to pour out whatever it is you need to do the mission. He went back to heaven to empower the church, not to abandon his followers. The ascension also uh, explains the disappearance of Jesus' physical body. You see, Jesus died publicly on a cross and was buried in a known location. And then his disciples are walking, they're about to go through Jerusalem, the very center of the Jewish religion, and say, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. So you can imagine a couple different scenarios. If he was resurrected from the dead as a normal man and lived a normal life, then he would die again. Well, that's not what happened, right? If he was resurrected from the dead and um, you couldn't find the body, or you could find the body, then you can falsify Christianity right off the bat. And Christianity would never have started. So he didn't live a normal life. He lived an ascended life. He ascended to the to the heaven and uh, is beside God the Father. Amen. If the disciples were lying, then the Jewish opposition would find the body and falsify Christianity. But they didn't because they couldn't because Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And who saw it? Reliable witnesses. If he's resurrected from the dead and sitting at the right hand of God. That means he's ruling with God in heaven. And that means he's still alive, and he's still the king. He still has the authority, he still has the glory, he still has the power, and we still have to be obedient to him. That's right. William Larkin says this, the angels describe in simple terms what's just happened. Jesus has been taken up into heaven. The implications are unmistakable. Jesus will no longer be with the disciples in the way he was with them during his earthly ministry or in post-resurrection appearances. In heaven, Jesus is in a position of authority at his Father's right hand where he can pour out salvation blessings as by his Spirit he directs and empowers the church's mission. He's in heaven. Why? Because that's where he's got the authority and the ability to help us do what he's called us to do. And so the followers of Jesus trust his position, his authority. You see, the introduction to Acts opens the door for all that comes next in the whole book of Acts. The followers of Jesus will be fully identified with him, with his message, and with his mission. And then, they'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out that mission. You see, some Christians are so focused on tasks that they lose sight of their mission. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who are pastors or in Christian ministry. I hear a lot about churches. Um, they complain about their churches. I don't complain about you. I don't have much to complain about, folks. You're awesome. When I think about other churches and, and some of the struggles that these guys face and some of the things that they're trying to get accomplished, they have churches who are filled with tasks. There's people shuffling stuff around, driving forklifts, metaphorically speaking, doing all kinds of Christian-y things. Oh yeah, we've got a youth group, and we've got a wanna, and we've got this, and we've got this, and we've got this. Do you have any life? Do you have any mission? And one of the things that, that I count as a metric of how we're doing as a church is, are we doing bringing people from outside Christianity to inside Christianity? And folks, that's where we do need to be better. We have to have a focus on mission, and we are bringing people into an understanding of who Jesus is and helping them become followers of Jesus. Otherwise, we're just shuffling things around. God forbid that we just do that. Do a whole bunch of Christian-y activity until the church fizzles out, because fizzling out is unacceptable. Other Christians are so heavenly-minded that they're no earthly good. They're just staring up into the heavens. Will Jesus come back and rescue us from this horrible world? Jesus isn't going to come rescue you. Well, he will eventually. But he left you here for a reason. And so I don't want to be the guy who's just standing there looking at the heavens and say, oh great, it's time for you to come back. Because he's going to come back and say, what did you do with the mission I left you to do? Oh, I was just waiting for you to... Yeah, I don't want to answer that. I want to be on mission. I want to be on task. I want to be doing what God has called me to do, what he left me here to do, and it's the Great Commission. It's following Jesus and helping other people follow Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so everything that I need to do can be focused down. It narrows what we're doing as a church. 
This happens all the time in uh, administrative meetings when we sit down and talk about, okay, what are we going to do next? Okay, how does it contribute to bringing people to Jesus? If it doesn't, then we shouldn't be doing it. If it does, then we should really be doing it. And when we think about what, are, what churches are having success, I ask uh, other local pastors, I say, what is your uh, annual new conversion growth rate? How many people, as a percentage, are you bringing from outside Christianity inside Christianity? I asked my friend, uh, one of my friends, and I said, is it 1%? 1%. New conversion growth rate. He kind of thought, and he said, mm, some years. Pastor, what's our new conversion growth rate? Let's just get one. Let's get 1%. We're about 60. We need one. Actually, 0.6, right? 0.6 per year. And then next, and, and then when we get that, let's get two. When we get two percent, let's get three percent. When we get three percent, let's get four percent. Because what the what the Book of Acts is going to show us is by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church exploded. <clears throat> Thousands of people were coming to faith daily. I can't help but think that the Holy Spirit that worked for them can work for us. That's right. Thank you. So a proper focus on mission gives meaning and significance to our tasks. If you take care of the property and grounds so we can use the church to talk to people about Jesus. If you provide finances, it's for the purpose of mission so that we can do outreach in our community. The task always supports the mission. A proper focus on mission helps us decide where are we going to invest our effort, where are we going to put the most, um, most money, the most resources, the most people. It's got to be the mission. It allows us to use metrics to define our progress or our lack of progress. 2017, uh, at the end of, or sorry, the beginning of 2018, we set three big goals. A 1 to 3% new conversion growth rate, that we are sharing the gospel with other people. 3 to 5% membership growth, and 3 to 5% new attendance growth. We're close on some of those. But those are the metrics by which we say, are we doing the mission that God put us here in Jackson County to do? People don't come to Jackson County by accident. They come here for a reason. The mission of the church is to follow Jesus and help others follow Jesus. This is called the Great Commission. When we do that, we're doing what God left us here to do. William Larkin says this, and this is the final thing that I'll close with. The fact that the Great Commission is the last instruction of the risen, now ascended, and imminently returning Lord gives it great weight. He is not mentioning an optional ministry activity for individuals with cross-cultural interests and churches with surplus funds with spare money. The Great Commission is the primary task the Lord left His church. The church must always be a missionary church. The Christian must always be a world Christian. As the guys uh, get ready for the offering and as uh, the praise team gets ready to come up, <clears throat> There, there is a task that we've been, has been set before us. It is to share Jesus with other people. And as we do that, as we step out trusting the Lord in that, I can't help but believe that He will empower us and help us. And so a lot of times what I ask for is, Lord, just give me enough boldness to say things to people that I meet. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for all that you've given. I pray for this offering, Lord, that you help us provide for the needs of the church, and Lord, I pray that you help us to stay on mission, Lord, because that's what you left us here to do. And I thank you, Father, for everything that you provided in your Son, Jesus, Lord. I ask that you bless this afternoon in fellowship, Lord, that we enjoy uh, good food together, and that you would be glorified in Christ's name.
really living for those. The heart of God is to see everybody who's out there, the people who don't know Him, and to know Him. And uh, I challenge you with this last song. Um, it's in your hymnal. It's He Leadeth Me. Uh, but you think on the words that uh, as we go throughout our day, Thank you.